Welcome to part two of the Estuary or Wetlands Model, sponsored by Fulbright Canada, RBC Eco Leadership Program, the Great Lakes Aquarium, and the Minnesota DNR Minaqua Program. Now that we have constructed our Estuary and Wetlands Model, we're going to manipulate it, um, pollute it, and remediate it. For this class activity, you will need four cups of water, three kinds of food coloring. I have red, green, and blue. You'll need about three teaspoons of unsweetened cocoa. You want unsweetened because anything with sugar in it will dissolve in the water and so you won't see it. You'll also want um, about three teaspoons of some sort of green leafy spice like parsley that's been dried. And you'll also want syrup, molasses, or vegetable oil. One of the great things about this model is not only is it very simple, easy, and inexpensive to make, but you can um, show its effects using things that you probably already have in your kitchen. You'll also want a stirring stick, most likely, and a piece of um, fake turf or a sample carpet square that you can pick up at your home improvement store. First of all, before we begin, you'll want to wet the sponges in your model down. These sponges don't hold a lot of water, so don't expect them to get soaking wet like uh, a dish sponge, but you'll still want to wet them down a little bit because that will help them pick up more of the water along the way. Okay. And you can see how all the rest of the water runs down into our nice area, which represents the lake. So this is the estuary of the wetlands, and then up here, where you'll be pouring things in, represents the river that is carrying in all the nutrients and particulates and water that it picks up from the surrounding watershed. So first of all, you want to show how uh, wetland functions, very basically. So we're going to use our red dye, and you can see how we have some green matter in it. That can be um, organic matter, like dead leaves and things that fall off into the river. And then we have some cocoa, which can be our sediment or our chemical matter, fertilizer, things you pick up through erosion. Now when you pour things into your wetland model, you want to make sure that it gets up and over into the sponges. So you sort of want to dump it all in at once. Um, you might want to pour a little bit right on the very side to kind of help uh, the water flow through into your sponges. And so we're just going to pour this in, just like that. Oh, I kind of overspilled. And you can see how, and then you just watch it filter through, and you can see how it's filtering through, so you can see the water coming out here. Um, a lot of it is filtering under, which is one of the reasons that we cut the sponge down, so you can see sort of where it passed through, otherwise it would just go through the sponge and you wouldn't be able to see it at all. And you can see how most of it got caught in the very beginning. And that helps, but some of it still ended up in the lake. And that helps illustrate how um, certain things, especially the sediment, you can see how the red is a darker color because of the cocoa. Um, some of this, some of the nutrients and some of the sediment will end up in the lake, which is important to a certain extent because lakes need nutrients too for their own system. But most of it stays in the estuary or the wetlands. And that makes them very productive systems. So they are really important in things like nutrient cycling um, and helping control the sedimentation rates of lakes. They're also very important habitats because they have all these lovely nutrients in their system. So they're fish nurseries, um, they're habitat for migrating birds, and they contain a lot of organisms, both micro and macro, that you won't find anywhere else. Now humans do not always see wetlands and estuaries as important habitats. To them, they were in the way of being on the lake or being by the nice, beautiful river. So a lot of times we degrade them. We fill them in or we drain them so we can build our homes or our factories right on the lake shore. We also use them for things like um, waste disposal and septic ponds. And so we're going to um, degrade our wetlands now. And you can do this by removing the sponges that we left free when we constructed the wetland. And so we've removed part of our wetland. Now when you remove a wetland, squeeze it out because when you degrade that land, everything that it was holding 
it's no longer holding, it can't hold it anymore. And see, we have all of this particulate matter up here, um, which we'll see what happens to that. So removing a wetland doesn't only impact what you remove, it can impact the wetland as a whole. Now you could remove both parts of the wetland door if you want, or if you want to make a comparison of how they act, you can leave your other wetland intact. And then we're going to hit it again. We're going to pour um, more of our nutrients and water input from the river. And you don't have to pour it just in the wetlands, you can kind of pour it everywhere because wetlands receive their water input from all over the place. And you can kind of see what's happening is that this one, it flowed all the way through, so the wetlands still got more. This one's moving much slower, so it's less effective. There's less wetlands to soak up all that goodness and create a nice thing. You also lost a lot more of the particulate matter that was stored here. So when you remove part of a wetland, it washes away the materials that were in the wetlands upstream of it. And also the wetlands downstream of it are either overcome, it can't, it can't focus on um, removing and passing and filtering all of that water. It's, it's overwhelmed um, by what you're giving to it. So it's just not as effective. Now, something else about estuaries, and wetlands in particular, is they don't only filter what comes from the river to the lake, they also filter what from the lake that can go back up the river. Because lake water can be pushed back up the river by storm events or winds, or in the case of the Great Lakes, something called a sesh, which is when the water kind of rocks from side to side. And so um, you can illustrate that by just picking up your pan a little bit and rocking water back. And then it'll refilter. And so you can kind of see how the lake now has more sediment, more nutrients that it washed out of the wetland. The wetland has this murky color that came from the lake. So it's, it's very interconnected. The lake um, goes through the wetlands to the river. The river goes through the wetlands or estuary to the lake. It's all interconnected and that's very important. Now, when you're working with your lake, um, this will start to get pretty deep, and if it gets too deep, uh, it won't really run down anymore. So you can either, if you're by a sink, you can kind of dump it out, or you can just take one of your cups and fill it up a little bit to help bring the water down to a more manageable level. And this is also helpful because you can see how what we put in has turned this murky brown. So if you're talking about pollution, this is really a very um, good way to illustrate how yucky um, pollution that we can put into a lake can get. Now, humans have realized how important estuaries and wetlands are to the health of the lake because what we put into a water system always comes back to us. We cannot put all this junk into a river um, degrade the wetland, let it go into the lake, and then we'll drink the water from the lake or use it in our daily lives. And so for the health of the entire system, as, long, as well as for our own health, we need to keep it all clean. And so humans have begun restoring wetlands. Um, something else that has made this more prevalent uh, that you may want to talk about with your class in the light of recent events is the function of oil. Now oil, oil is a very thick viscous fluid which we have, um, which we are going to illustrate using syrup. And so you can see how it sort of sits on the bottom. So we're going to stir it up a little bit to make sure it goes into our wetland but it doesn't really stir up, so you can see those thick swirls. And that's how oil works a lot in water. So it'll coat the bottom, and your oil spill can come from various places. It could be a factory leak up river that flows down towards the lake. It could be a tanker leak in the lake that would flow back up towards the river. So we're just gonna ooh, pour this in. See how it looks and see how it's all thick and viscous running down? Now 
Now one of the things about oil is that it moves very, very slowly, which helps wetlands filter it. But the other thing is, is that we'll, um, the wetlands will keep it. So restoring wetlands from an oil spill can be very difficult because they're very dense vegetation um, and they'll just keep it and sediment it. And that's bad because it can remove a lot of habitat. A lot of the habitat that wetlands have are in the water or on the bottom, um, on the bottom of the wetland bed. And so you'll remove a lot of habitat, kill a lot of animals, um, could lead to local extinction. So it's a major issue. Now we're going to go back to restoring wetlands. So we're just going to put our wetland back. And when you put it back, you can see how all the pollution we've put into the wetland has changed this part of the wetland, say, compared to this nice clean part that we had had earlier. Now humans have come up with various activities that you or your class can get involved in to help keep your wetlands clean. So you can do things like help restore habitat, you can clean the wetland, um, support legislation that sets wetlands aside as reserves or supports research or the protection of wetlands. And then there are several things you can do at home. Don't throw hazardous chemicals away, don't use fertilizer on your lawns. And something else um, you can do if you live right on the water is to install a vegetative barrier strip. And what, vegetative, um, and what a vegetative barrier is, is about 20 feet of grass, um, hopefully native grass, that you don't mow. Humans like to have that nice clean lawn mowed all the way down to the waterfront, but that helps, um, but that allows for a lot of erosion. And so you want, um, you want to, you, you want a vegetative barrier. And so right here you can see, this is our vegetative barrier. So this is our um, fake turf for your carpet square. And then this is a lawn that's been clean cut all the way down to the bottom. So we're going to use our last glass of water to represent how a vegetative barrier works. So we're going to pour it up there. So you can see how it works. On this side where it's clean, most of the particulate matter, the sediment, and the other um, pollutants that can go into a, a estuary wetlands like fertilizer, most of it washed in to the wetlands right there. Whereas on this side, the vegetative barrier, the grass, um, helped catch things before it entered the wetlands. One of the best ways to keep our water systems clean is to not put things in them in the first place. Now that is the end of the wetlands. It's very easy to clean up. Just dump everything out in the sink and give it a good rinse. And then you can use it again for um, as many classes as you would like. So hopefully this has illustrated how wetlands and estuaries function to clean water, how humans have um, polluted them, destroyed them in some places, and then restored them, and how to keep wetlands safe.